Hey, I'm excited this morning. We are just blazing trails through Genesis. We hit chapter 2 today. I mean, that's pretty big time. Genesis chapter 1, we started, what, about a year and a half ago? Um, we've had a few interruptions. Um, I, I, here, this is how much slower we're going than I anticipated. Um, next Sunday, uh, I will be on the road, so I will not be here to teach. Uh, Pastor David Fleming will be coming back to teach next Sunday. He's excited to see you. Please uh, love on him. He'll be here, and we planned what he would preach or teach eons ago. And I said, let's see, November 4th. By then, oh man, I'll be through Genesis, uh, uh, creation, Garden of Eden, Noah and the Flood, Tower of Babel, I'll be, Abraham. Why don't you get ready for Abraham? Well, I haven't had the heart to tell him. <laughs> because I know he's been working on it for a month. So next Sunday, love on him and pretend we've made it to Abraham. <laughs> but we haven't. We're in the Garden of Eden. And I know what you're thinking, Mark. You took that picture in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> Not, I didn't. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, with all, all uh, uh, humor aside, I want to do three things today. So here's your roadmap of what's coming. First, the story basics. Garden of Eden, basic information, basic meaning of the story. And then after that, we'll hit a second point where we'll look at some deeper textures. And by that, I mean we're going to read it in context, context of scripture and context of culture in that day. And we'll explore some deeper textures as we have time to do. And then I want to not just look at those deeper textures there, but I want to look at some special New Testament colorings or insights into the Garden of Eden story. Now, I'm not going to get to the fall. So after Pastor David teaches next Sunday on Abraham, we will leapfrog back and pick up the fall the following Sunday. I mean, it's, it's autumn anyway, so we ought to be spending some time on the fall. Um, that was autumnal humor. So let's get started. Point number one, the story basics. Now, you can't get the story basics without remembering the foundation that we built on for the last five classes or so on this. So uh, everything that I've been doing has been very deliberately building on each other. And statistics show that one-third of y'all come just about every week. Two-thirds of y'all come less frequently. And that's okay because we've got an incredible internet team that puts all of this stuff on the web and you can always go back and watch if you s remember, hey, I didn't see that. And that seems like that might be important. I'd like to catch up on that. So you can do so. But this whole thing started with the idea that there are five books of Moses. Moses doesn't appear until Exodus, the second book. And he dies at the end of Deuteronomy. So he's in four of those books. But the five books of Moses actually has what we call a, a, a prequel. And that's Genesis. You might remember I used the illustration of the prequel for Lonesome Dove, which was Dead Man's Walk. Prequel, Genesis is providing the foundation to understand the rest of the books of Moses, which then provide the foundation to understand the rest of the Old Testament, which then provides the foundation for understanding the New Testament which then provides the foundation for us understanding the walk of a Christian. 
And so within the framework of that, week one I explained that, and I went to a lot more detail and said we need to remember Genesis was written for us. It's written for all people for all times. But it was written to ancient Israel. And that should affect the way we read it and understand it. Because it's written in ancient Hebrew, using ancient vocabulary, and an ancient understanding of the world. So if we put that into its total picture, I said in week two, we will treasure God's word more when we read it in context. So then as we propelled through week three and week four, I said the context is the setting of Mount Sinai somewhere around 1240 B.C. when God is speaking to Moses. Now Moses had been raised, actually you raise chickens, you rear children. Moses had been reared, thank you Miss Kingston, 11th grade English. <laughs> Moses had been reared in Pharaoh Seti, the first household. He had been an adopted son of Pharaoh Seti, the first daughter. And so Moses appears there and Stephen tells us that he's instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Mighty in his words and deeds. And so for one class I went into great detail about what the wisdom of the Egyptians was. This is actually the painting of, of the building that still exists. The tomb temple of Pharaoh Seti. And so we know what Moses had been taught about the world, and I went through that. But it wasn't simply what Egypt understood, because there was communication between the other cultures. Moses does spend four decades on, on uh, Mount Sinai and in the wilderness, being influenced by the other cultures in that area. And so... Two weeks ago, I discussed with you the stories of those local cultures. Now, the Hittites are a little farther north. They're in Syria into Turkey. But we talked about the story of El Kunirsha, um, El, the creator of the earth. El is a Semitic word for God. And we talked about the story of not only him as creator, but the chaos that was the serpent. If you get up to the Hittite world, the serpent had a different symbolism than the serpent did in Egypt. In Egypt, the serpent was an indicator of a god and of, uh, 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 you know, the, the pharaohs would even wear these heads at times that had the asp coming out of them. So uh, you've got the serpent, and we learned from the stories of the Hittites that they believed the operation of the universe required every deity to properly perform his or her function. The gods had to do what was their job right. If the god of rain doesn't tend to the rain, then it doesn't rain. If the god of, you know, fill in the fertility doesn't tend to fertility, your livestock are stillborn or you don't have children. And, and this was the mentality out in the pagan world. Calamity would happen if a god abandoned their post. I talked about the wrath of Telepanu. And, and if you want to go back and look at those, it's a much more extended class, but that was two weeks ago. We went down south a little bit closer to Egypt, to Ugarit. Ugarit is a city. It's got its own Semitic language that you can study because there were a lot of tablets found there. If you want to study Ugaritic, uh, I know where you can get the grammar books at the nearby theological library, and you can learn Ugaritic. I would urge you to learn Hebrew first because you'll need that, that uh, help with the Semitic language and thought forms. But Ugarit, like the other civilizations, thought that gods were basically supersized humans take a human being with all of their pluses and all of their minuses and make them supersized like driving through mcdonald's supersize me and you supersize a human being and you got a god
But that means that the God has supersized good and supersized bad. Because they're just like us, just bigger. They just tend to live longer. They just tend to do things more grandiose. And we talked about the Baalu myth, which was Baal, as we read that word in the Old Testament. We talked about the, the, the dawn and dusk being different gods and, and all of these different aspects of nature that are actually gods, supposedly, present in nature. We looked at some of the Akkadian texts that we've got, and especially two that are relevant uh, within the framework of today. The Enuma Elish, was one that set forwards all of the gods and it talked about all the problems if the gods don't get enough sleep. And so the gods don't get enough sleep, they get grouchy, they get upset, and it ruins their day. And if a god doesn't tend to their job, it affects human beings. So thank goodness for Marduk who managed to save the day when the gods were running amok by uh, uh, killing the ones that were too whiny over sleep. Then we talked about the Atrahasis, which is a very important text. It's a seminal understanding of the pagan neighbors of Moses and Israel. And this is one where, if you'll recall, the major gods exist and they create a next level of gods who create the next layer of gods. And it's like the family tree of the gods is breaking down and, 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 and opening up. And finally the jobs, I mean, the, the gods are given, the lesser gods are given chores. And one of the chores they're given is to dig the Tigris and Euphrates River. Well, I don't know about you, but that can wipe you out. I mean, seriously, that is tiring work even for a supersized human being. Those rivers are long. And so the gods start complaining and they decide to go on strike. And they just said, we're not doing this anymore. And the older god said, well, we told you to do it. And the young rebellious teenage god said, well, tough. <laughs> and so they find a compromise. They're going to create human beings to do the drudge work. And the human beings can finish making up the creation and doing all of the hard work. See, this is what it said. It said, when the gods, instead of man, did the work, bore the loads, the gods' loads was too great. The work was too hard. The trouble was too much. Heavens, this will wear a god out. Um, the slaughter of Al-Ilu. I talked about it briefly. Um, it, it is the continuation of these uh, uh, stories. Al-Ilu is a god who is killed so that the bones and the dust and the blood of the god can be mixed up with the clay of the earth and make people. And this is what the pagans believed. This was the origin of humanity. We've been made to take over the drudge work for the gods because they're fed up with it and they give us just the garbage can work. And the reason we exist and have life is because they ground up some dead miner who cares God. And mixed up the blood. And that's us. By the way, we'll talk about the Atrahasis yet again, along with the Epic of Gilgamesh, when we get to the flood. Because the floods come there too. The gods get upset because people are too noisy. So we're just going to flush them down the commode. Those stories are all relevant. That entire lead up is relevant if we're going to read the Garden of Eden and understand it. So now let's talk about the Garden of Eden for a moment. Because 
it's, it's an interesting issue here on what it is and where it is. It's an interesting issue because the creation of the world and humanity from Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-3 happened in six days. Remember? Okay. Then you get to Genesis 2-4 and now you've got the creation of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Now this raises an interesting question. There are actually three views, but I think one of them I don't ascribe to very well, so I deep-sixed it. I'm not even covering it. I'll throw it out there for you. I mean, one view is, is that whoever was putting the Bible together just had these two different stories and decided, hey, let's throw them both in there, and you got two alternate versions. I don't agree with that. Um, I, I don't think that that, that gives the integrity that, that I believe is there behind it. So instead, I, I go with the other two choices. These are either sequential or synoptic. Now, those aren't words that we typically use in our language every day, so let's try and explain what I mean. If they're sequential stories, like, where's Larry Burgess? Yeah. Walton believes that they're sequential. He's a Waltonian. Um, sequential. Sequential means God creates the world and humanity in six days. Then, at some later unknown time, and remember, the six days... You pay your money and take what you want on whether that's six 24 hours, six time periods, whether or not it's, it's the poetic understanding of form and filling. or that's, that's a whole different class. That's last class. But what you have that story, take it as you will, and then he believes Genesis is saying sometime later there's a section of land where we have the Genesis 2 story. They're sequential in that sense. Um, synoptic. Synoptic, you might know that word from the Gospels. We have three synoptic Gospels that tell the same story just through different lenses. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, synoptic comes from two Greek words. It means to see things alongside each other. The synoptic way would have to shift our picture around some. The synoptic way says these are telling the same type of story. It's just one is integrated into the other. So if you go back and you remember this chart I've been putting up here, the earth is without form and void, Genesis 1, 2. And then what God does is he forms that which is without form, and he fills that which is void. So on day one, he forms light and darkness. So they have a, a, a form. He forms heavens separated from the waters. He forms land and plants and vegetation with the land. That's all formed. Then he's got three days where he fills what he formed. So on day four, he fills the light and darkness with the sun, moon, and stars. He fills the heavens and the waters with birds and fish. He fills the land which has vegetation with animals, bugs, and people. So you, you've got that in Genesis 1.1. If you then just separate that out, the synoptic idea is that in the process of that on day six when humans are created that's when God gives us this story of Genesis 2. Now it's there's there's a problem and one of the one of the difficulties maybe that's the way to say it with reading it that way is Genesis 2 5 through 7 when no bush of the field was yet in the land 
no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. And so you sit there and you say, ah, how can that happen when day three he did land and vegetation? And day six he does people. So it, it's one of these things that make you say, hey, God's got more to this story than I'm reading with my Western mind and my 21st century thinking. And I need to climb back into the context to understand what was going on. So are the two stories se sequential? See, sequential doesn't have a problem with that because sequential says when no bush of the field was yet in the land, the land, Haaretz, uh, Haaretz, the land, uh, Aretz is land. It's also the word that's translated earth. And so you, you could say that this is saying there's no bush of the field yet in the whole earth. Or you could just say in the land that he's going to be talking about here as he creates the Garden of Eden. There's an implication of something or the other because it says that it, it wasn't raining yet. It was just mist that was... So you, you sit there and, you, and you, you can juggle through it. If we had time and interest and inclination, I could go into great detail on which one I believe is most likely. But the bottom line is, you take your pick. Because you can read it validly either way and not miss the import of what God is saying. So with that in mind, I want to look at the storyline of the Garden of Eden. And the storyline starts out with the creation of Adam. And it sets up this way. I'll put the scripture up above uh, so that you can follow along with me. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to the sight. I mean, that in itself is pretty cool. Because there are some trees that are pleasant to the sight that I can't grow in this climate that I would love to be able to grow. Every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the storyline starts to shift a little bit we start to get some information on where the Garden of Eden is located. Now, when I was a kid, and I figured out there was such a thing as an atlas and maps, I decided I was going to find where the Garden of Eden was. Because I thought, even if like there's some angel there keeping me from going in, I'd still kind of like to see it from the outside. So I got my map out. And I got my Bible out. And here's what the Bible says. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. Okay? Okay. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. Pishon. It's the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Asher. The English Standard Version translates it as Syria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Well, I'm ready to go, man. I got my Rand McNally. A lot of y'all don't even remember what that was. I got my, my atlas, I got my map, and I'm going to locate it. Okay, let's see what we got here. 
right over here. We got the uh, Tigris River. Starts up there in Turkey, flows all the way down to the Gulf. And then we got the Euphrates right there. We have got two of the four rivers. So now all I got to do is find the Gihon. Well, the Gihon is geeded up and gone. We got no clue where it is. Oh, there's a Gihon spring in, in Jerusalem, but that's not what it's talking about. We, we got nothing. We don't know where the Gihon is. Well, maybe I'm just having a little bad sight. How about the Pishon? No, we ain't got that either. No clue. Absolutely no clue what river's being talked about. What about uh, uh, Havilah, where all the gold is? Well, there's about five, six different places called Havilah, and we're not sure that any of them are the right place. As for Cush, well, there's a bunch of places called Cush, but one of them is down south of Egypt. And that is, by the way, a, a, a source where Egypt got some of its gold. But we don't have a clue where this place is. And as Pastor Jarrett said to me when, when I was uh, uh, talking to him about it, he said, well, that's probably just as good because we'd have gone over there and built a bunch of tourist traps. <laughs> he said, it'd be just like the Holy Land. We'll just build a church on it. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so location I got nothing for you. Purpose and prohibition follow this story next. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Again, day doesn't mean 24 hours. Day can mean 24 hours, but it can also just mean a period of time. But no way around understanding the fact here. The fact is, if you sin, you die. Now, some might say, well, how did Adam even know what death is? But, so often in Scripture, we get a shorthand rendition of what was said or communicated. You know, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, you can read it in about 11 minutes, but it probably took longer than 11 minutes to give it because that's kind of a synopsis. You know, you get some of Paul's speeches. Paul's defense on, on Mars Hill didn't take the 45 seconds it takes to read it. You know, that's just a... So we don't know how God explained it or what God explained, but we can walk away and we know what death is and we understand, as Israel did when it was written to them, if you sin, you die. And that was communicated quite clearly. Now, there's the creation at this point of Eve, the helper. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper that's fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field. Every bird of the heavens and brought him to the man to see what he'd call him. Well this is important, that little detail. Because we've already been told that it's out of the dust of the ground that God had made Adam. So out of the dust of the ground, he'd also made all the other beasts and every bird of the heavens and brought them to him to see what he'd call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every uh, thing that's out there. Now, we want to say something here. 
Because giving names is a God trait. <clears throat> Tizzy, our dog, doesn't have names for us. Um, oh, I tease Becky that our dog calls her the house lady. But he's pro she's probably not really doing that. That's what I do. The house lady to Tizzy, not to me. She's my dear wife. But th this giving of names is what God does before he creates Adam and Eve. God calls the light day and he calls the darkness night. And it was. God calls the waters above and the heavens and the earth. God gives names until Genesis 2 where God says to Adam, you're in my image, you get to give the names. And so Adam does. Adam's functioning quite well in the image of God. But Adam is alone because none of those animals are companions that are fit for him. And so he gives names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heaven, uh, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs. The Hebrew actually means one of his sides, part of his side. Can mean a rib, doesn't have to mean a rib, but something out of his side. And closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And brought her to the man. Then the man said... This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. By the way, this is probably the first poem in the Bible. Adam was a poet. I bet you didn't know it. But his feet showed it because they were long fellas. Um, <clears throat> Miss Carolyn, that joke's too old to laugh at. Um, <clears throat> then the man <laughs> said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. See, Hebrew poetry would, would um, put things in phrases that are um, parallel to each other. So bone of my bones paralleled by flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, we lose that in the English. But the word for man is ish. The word for woman is isha. So she's going to be isha, which is just the female form of the word of man. So, she'll be called Isha. She's a female form of the male. And this is why a man will leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The Ish will leave his mother and father and hold fast to his Isha. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now we've got some extra insight here if we're looking at this. And remember it's written in ancient Hebrew, ancient vocabulary, ancient understanding. And because of that we can learn a few things about it that are fairly important. One of which oh, is, by the way, not helper. Let me go back to Eden, the Garden of Eden. We don't know where it is, but we know what it was because Eden is the Hebrew word. It, it's enveloped in the Hebrew concept, is a better way of saying it, of something that, that is abundant. 
something that's pleasant, something that's, that's utopic, wonderful, everything you could hope for. But I think we need, more importantly, to look at the Hebrew word helper because it has been misunderstood by many who read the text. Many who read the text say, this is a sign that God is sexist. You know, that he's putting women down. Adam was made, and the woman's there to help him. As if that's a derogatory thing. And that's not fair to the Hebrew here. The Hebrew word for helper is etzer, 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 etzer. And we might even translate it as an ally. Someone who's, I mean, it's, there's nothing inferior about the helper in the Hebrew word. That's, so that makes it really tough to translate. And you say, well, are you sure? Yeah, let me give you a couple passages to support my proposition. Here's Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our helper. It's the same word. And our shield. We do not want to say that God's just an inferior part of our life. He is our helper. Hosea 13, 9 says, He destroys you, O Israel. God destroys you because you're against me, God, against your helper. Same word. God is the helper. So Eve is like God in that regard. That's not saying she's less in any stretch of the imagination in that Hebrew word. So if those are sort of some story basics, some information and some meanings, let's look into some of the deeper contextual readings we can get here. And I want to start by contrasting this with some competing narratives. And when we contrast it with the competing narratives, those narratives of Egypt and of of the Levant, of, of the Mesopotamian cultures, they had a whole different vision, a whole different purpose, and a whole different mission of humanity. People were not made in the image of God to see the world and to do the things the way that gods would. Pharaoh was made in the image of God, but not the Egyptian people. Hence, Pharaoh was worshipped as God. You can go back and find all the ancient kings typically believed that they were specially endowed by God to be God on earth. And that's not the vision of humanity that is there in the, the Genesis story. This Garden of Eden story isn't that one person is uniquely in the image of God. You've got male and female made in the image of God, Genesis 1 tells us. And then when we get into Genesis 2, you see this. He, it's, it's Adam who gets to name the names. He's got a special creative, there's a vision for humanity wrapped up in Adam. Not that he's some unique fellow himself. And that gets us to the purpose. Because the purpose is highly different. And remember, the surrounding cultures. These are the cultures that God said, don't pollute yourself hanging around. They will distort your theology. To which the Israelites said, well, you know, he can't be serious about that. These are strangers. Let's welcome the strangers and interbreed with them. And we know what happened. And that, by the way, happens before they take the promised land. They do that while they're out in the midst of these people. But the purpose of humanity isn't to do the drudge work. God wasn't looking to make slaves. 
God wasn't trying to get out of something. God's not digging the Tigris in Euphrates by the sweat of his brow like a supersized human being. God speaks and it's there. God doesn't break a sweat. God does it in six days. And if you look at it, it says he made it in six days. If you read it carefully, it took like 30 seconds a day. Let there be light. Done. All right, that's quitting time for today. I'll come back tomorrow, do something else. I mean, the, God doesn't need us to do his dirty work. But that doesn't mean we're without purpose or we're an accident. It's to the contrary. We are the, the culmination of his creation. We are the high point of his creation. We are, remember, if you go back in the other lessons, uh, in two of them we made reference to the fact, but it's the very last one I did where I showed you some of these uh, actual monuments, that kings would erect monuments when they invaded or established a land, and the monument would have a picture of the king to say, this is mine. Well, that picture of the king is the image of the king. God creates this world and says, now I need, I need my image here to show my authority over here. So I'm going to put everything under your authority. You are in dominion over everything. You rule over it all. I'm putting you here. You're my image. And everybody should be looking at you saying that's the image of God. That's a pretty big deal. And God says, I want to give you a mission. I'm putting you in this garden. I want you to work it. And I want you to, to keep it. Guard it. Figure it out. And so he gives them purpose. And, and that's amazing. And it contrasts with the other narratives. Because we're not gods. We're made by God. And the world stuff aren't gods it's a logical progressive creation where things reproduce after their kind it's set up to run but we're not gods the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and into his nostrils breathed the breath of life so we're not gods, but what else does it say? We're not animals either. There's a distinction between us and them. For Adam, there wasn't found a helper fit for him. So this story stands in stark contrast to the competing narratives. This story gives significance, purpose, meaning, and, and mission to anyone who reads it and understands it. Now, there are some other little contextual themes that are found in here. One which a lot of scholars grab onto. Uh, I've talked about it before in here. Um, uh, uh, I remember one time when I interviewed Tom Wright, we talked about it in here. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's fairly common, but you may not have remembered it or you may not read of it that often, but there's a real temple theme that makes sense if we read Genesis as a prequel to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Remember in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the people are told how to build a tabernacle. That's the place where God would meet with his people, specifically the priests. But that's what becomes the temple later on when Solomon builds the temple. And the significance of the tabernacle and the temple was that God is present among his people in a palpable way. We understand this now. And, and we'll go into more detail, I hope, at some point. But this thread is carried through in the New Testament significantly. Because Paul says that you are, your bodies are the temple of God. 
And so he meets with you in a palpable way in your body because his spirit dwells within you. It was always the spirit of God. God is a spiritual being. This was not God, you know, coming down from a cloud in a flying saucer and climbing out and going into the temple to meet with people. God's spiritual presence was there with the people. And they knew that. And so, so that's the significance of the temple. Well, that's present within the context of this story. Eden is a place where God would meet with Adam and Eve. He would walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden. He fashioned them. He brought the animals for Adam to name. He comes in and when Adam's asleep, he takes part of his side. He creates woman. God is, is active there and present there. You can even read the, the unwinding of the story of creation in a way that helps us understand the temple. But I don't have time for that. What I will tell you is if you look at the Genesis 2.15 passage that says, I want you, I'm putting you in the garden, I want you to work it, and I want you to keep it. Those two words in Hebrew, Ebed and Shamar, those two words, work and keep, are very important words in the rest of the books of Moses. Because those are the words that are used to talk about what the priests should be doing in serving in the tabernacle. They are doing the work of God and they are to keep it clean and pure and holy and, and work through it. Keep it on guard, keep people from coming in who aren't supposed to be in. Do everything right. And so you've got these deeper contextual meanings that are each worthy of one or two weeks if we had the time. But we don't. And so what we'll do is we'll move to the third point for the day. And those are New Testament textures behind this. One of them is the temple theme. The temple theme continues throughout the New Testament. I mean, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But first, personal relationship. We exist in relationships to other. God doesn't call people simply to be a Christian. He doesn't say simply, Christopher, you're a Christian. And that's it. He calls us to be part of a larger body of Christ. That's one reason we don't forsake the assembling together of the saints. It's a very important thing. You say, well, I don't like going to church. Well, life is hard and then you die. <laughs> um, you don't, uh, what, what is it that British poet said? Um, you can't always get what you want if you're calling Mick Jagger a poet. Um, it's, it's important. The, the fellowship does something. We're transformed when we're around people and in relationships. And relationships are very important. But all of those relationships, this isn't a, um, a, uh, a book club. The reason this relationship can be what it is is because each of us does have an individual relationship with God. So when Jesus says, look, I'll destroy the temple and I'll rebuild it in three days and he's talking about the temple of his body, he, he is dwelling with us. He was palpably present. But there are more nuances than just the relationship that's manifested there. You know, Jesus can quote it when, when asked, is it right to divorce? And Jesus says, well, I mean, you know, Jesus' mindset was, what do you want to know by right? You know, it, it, it wasn't made to be that way. And Jesus quotes from Matthew or Genesis 2. Man will leave his mother and father, cling to the woman and the two become one flesh and then Jesus says what God has joined together let no man draw asunder then they said well then how come Moses allows it and tells us how to do a divorce 
And Jesus says, because you were going to kill each other. Because, of, he doesn't say it that way, but he says, because of the hardness of your heart. You know, they, this is a struggle relationship world. And so God sometimes is trying to make the best of a good situation. It's not his perfect design. His perfect design is unity. But there are times where there's disunity in this world and he's figured out how to work in the midst of that as well. He can bring beauty out of ashes. But Paul's writing about it in Ephesus. Writing to the Ephesians about it, I should say. He writes to them about the temple being rebuilt. But even more so, he writes and says, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Then he says, this mystery is profound. I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, way back then, God already had this figured out as a, as a picture and a symbol and an image of Christ and his church. And we see laced throughout the New Testament this idea of it being a marriage. Which has got an Old Testament root too. God had married the Israelites. All right, lots more we can say about this, but we've come to an end of our time. So I want to do our points for home. And as always, I have three of them. First, human dignity. My icons deliberately chosen. Regardless of gender, regardless of color, regardless of age, regardless of education level, regardless of placement in society, regardless of job, regardless of personality, regardless of fill in the blank, everyone is made in the image of God. And everyone has a dignity because of that. Now, some people totally distort that image. And God will deal with that. And sometimes we have to address that. Now, you go back to World War II and what Hitler was doing. And those certain powerful people within the Third Reich. Well, it's absolutely right to go stand against them because... Even though they're image bearers of God, they have so marred that image. And in the process, they're destroying other image bearers of God. But it's not anything, no war is something that's gone in lightly. We always have to very carefully measure and determine what we're doing in this crazy fallen world. But we never forget that we treat people with dignity even if they vote different than us. Number two, equality. While he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. That is not in any way, shape, or fashion saying anything other than woman and man, I'm sorry, I can't handle this, it doesn't show right. Woman and man are, um, there. Hold on, hold on, hold on, I know we're out of time, but you got to be able to see it. Okay, while he slept, took one of his ribs, look, he could have said he took his foot bone. So man steps on woman. Could have said he took his head. So man looks at the woman and says, tell me what I'm thinking. But he took it just dead center. Because the two are the same. Paul says there's not male or female in Christ. And then third and finally, work. Work is not a bad thing. The Lord God put him in the Garden of Eden and told him to work. That's before the fall. Work is a good thing. 
find where God wants you to use your skill and talent. He didn't make you just to enjoy life. He made you to do things on mission for him. And we need to figure out what that is. And that, my friends, is the overview lesson, which may be all we have time for in the Garden of Eden, though we will look at the fall, God willing, in two weeks. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus? Thank you, Miss Caroline. Um, God, we pray that you'll be blessed uh, and praised by our class, our study, our time. But I really directly pray that you will touch each person in here in ways that, that draw us to kick up our walk with you in notches never before seen. Lord, we want to bless you like we've never blessed you. We want to be better image bearers for you. We want to walk tighter with you. We want to be in fellowship better with you and with your, your bride. But we can't do any of that without your spirit working within us. So we pray, we beg, we plead, Lord, send your spirit to embolden us, to lead us, to guide us, convict us, to teach us, to train us, remind us, do all of those things that your spirit does for us. In the name of Jesus, amen.